Hey y'all, I'm going to talk a little bit today about artificial neurons and audio. Those of you who have been following along probably saw I threw up a whole bunch of videos over the summer, including building artificial neurons in pure data and jamming with these ideas. I think artificial neurons are really neat because they blend ideas from a whole stack of things that I've been interested in lately, including feedback, analog synthesis and nonlinearity, and of course, machine learning and music. Coming back to my explorations of modular synths, I was kind of focused for a while about finding the most unique modules that I could find. Again, I've done digital synthesis for years, and to help myself rationalize the costs of what I was investing in analog synthesizers, I wanted to find the most unusual things that it had to offer. One module I came across was this nonlinear circuits neuron, and this was additionally great because it was simple enough for me to DIY one myself. Beyond that, there's a benefit that there's a free version of this module in VCV Rack, which is also a free software, so I can demo this here in a way that you can explore it yourself, too. Before we get into that, let's talk about this general idea of neurons, though. For us audio folks, a good way to think about it is a neuron is basically just a mixer. It takes in inputs at different weights, or levels as we would say in audio, it mixes them, and then it applies an activation function and this activation function is usually a nonlinear transformation of the mix signal. Then it outputs it. What is this nonlinear transformation? Well, there are lots of possible transformations. Rectification, for example, saturation, etc. For example, what us audio folks would call half wave rectification, ignoring the negative half of a waveform, is a popular activation function in machine learning called a rectified linear unit activation function. Hyperbolic tangent, which again in audio we use for soft clipping, is also common in machine learning. Of course, if we're audio mixing, then the distortion of the sound will change significantly based on the activation function. Just a quick aside here, saturation, rectification, wave folding make the waveform nonlinear, but filtering, for example, wouldn't count because a filter isn't a nonlinearity of the wave shape, it depends on time, you know, the frequency, how those amplitudes play out over time. Okay, so why neuron mixing? Well, directly, there's no practical reason to do it. Clean, linear mixing is great. You know what you're getting. So let's talk about impractical reasons then. As we search for new sounds, it can be interesting to check out models from nature for inspiration. To me, this is enough reason to be interested, but it's also worth noting that with AI permeating more and more of our lives, it's nice to have an artistic window into demystifying the technology. And, as always, repurposing technology for artistic expression is one of the most humane activities that we can engage in. Now, nonlinearity in audio is nothing new. I've spoken before about the Moog CP3 mixer and its asymmetrical clipping. We could consider that as an artificial neuron. It takes in multiple signals. Clipping is a nonlinearity. It doesn't have to do the Moog's clipping, you can say that just run-of-the-mill digital hard clipping is a nonlinearity. And of course, this imperfection, this nonlinearity in analog gear, in vintage equipment, is what a lot of people say contributes to its warmth. So let's crack open VCV Rack and look at this digital model of the nonlinear circuits neuron. All right, here I am in VCV Rack. Quick disclaimer, I'm in no way an expert in VCV Rack. Everything I'm using here is in the free version or as a free download. I think this is a pretty neat way to recreate modular synthesis at no cost. Okay, just to make sure we're clear, LFO, this is our low frequency oscillator. This is just a oscilloscope, and this is an audio out, which we're not actually gonna use at first here. So let's just take a sine wave from our LFO, run it into in two here. All right, so nothing in the neuron, right? This is just what our LFO sine wave looks like. I can slow it down, slow down the frequency, bring up the frequency, etc., etc. So for the purpose of visualizing this, let's now take this sine wave, put it into the input of the neuron here, and run it to the output. And I'm going to run that, and so this will be the orange wire is the neuron. All right. So I'm not doing any kind of mixing yet. But we can clearly see the nonlinearity. What's happening now is when this sine wave drops below a certain level, it jumps up to this level. Now I have two knobs here. Let me turn them a bit. This is the sensitivity knob. 
And so this seems to be reducing that threshold that it jumps up. Oh, and I can almost get back to my regular sine wave, but there's still that little nonlinearity in there. Okay, let's play with the response. Again, you can see this is sort of, whoops, offsetting up. Offsetting down here. Sensitivity. All right, so basically it's like when this sine wave gets below a certain threshold, the neuron fires, right? And it jumps up to the top there. Okay, I'm not going to talk about this bottom part because it's not really a, a neuron, but it's, uh, it's a useful thing. Command D for that LFO. Let's take this LFO and let's put it into input two here. That's a slow LFO. Let's crank it up. All right, so now we have multiple signals coming in, being mixed, and turned into a neuron response. Okay, this is all well and good, but it's a bit boring with just LFOs, so let's delete those. Let's add instead of VCO. So now here's my VCO, sine wave in. Let's change our time here so we can see this a bit better. All right. So now, okay, just because it's going to get too confusing, let's get rid of our original sine wave there. And let's run this out to our speakers. Duplicate it. Duplicate it. This neuron can take in three different inputs, right? All right, that sounded pretty great. Just for comparison's sake, let's add a mixer here. So this is a regular mixer, a linear mixer. Sine, sine, sine. Oh, I gotta do this. All right, with a little bit of regular clipping, this is what it sounds like if we linear mix those together. Again, if I get rid of the clipping, but that's not really fair, that's cheating, huh? Back to our neuron. It's not very useful to look at it that way, but... Now remember that part of the neuron is being able to weight your different inputs, and so I don't have this ability to weight these. I need little attenuators or something in order to change the amplitude of all of these. But again, a pretty excellent sounding nonlinearity. Of course, I don't have to do this with sine waves. We could do it with Whoops. We could do it with triangle waves instead. Let's get these out of the way here. Sawtooth waves. Make one really low. Now, is this sonically, musically useful? That depends on your situation. I would absolutely say yes. But it's gonna depend on what you're going for. So, finally, you also don't have to do this in VCU Rack. I already have a video about how to make a neuron mixer in pure data. Here's one in Reactor.
Here's one in max MSP. Kima. And even without the nonlinear circuits neuron, I can combine a mixer and a wave folder in Neurorack and call that an analog neuron too. Again, in the case of our sonic explorations, different nonlinear transformations will lead to different sonic results. There's no real better or worse, but you can make the decisions about what choices are better serving your aesthetic goals. Now, a neuron in and of itself isn't doing any learning at all. It's not machine learning. It's not artificial intelligence. But if you start to feed it back on itself, so it reacts to its own output in combination to its input, then absolutely that's artificial intelligence. Whether we can call that machine learning, whether that learning is musically useful or not, we'll save that conversation for another day. Do some nonlinear mixing, call it a neuron, and let me know what you come up with.